Hello and welcome to the Spectre Dive 10 launch seminar. Uh, my name is Max Self. I'm a product manager here at uh, Biognosis, and I will give you a quick overview of uh, what we have planned for this seminar. So please uh, welcome our speakers. Here they are. Uh, Simone Di Sanso and Tejas Gandhi. So I will first give you a short overview of our uh, company and about how our software products can uh, help with your proteomics projects. Um, and I'll then hand over to Tejas Gandhi. He's the lead, uh, lead developer of SpectreDive and head of bioinformatics at Biognosis. And he will give you more insights into key features of SpectreDive, including the support for uh, Thermos Shurquan technology. And finally, we're welcoming our guest speaker, Simone Di Sanso from Alessandro Ori's lab at the Leibniz Institute on Aging. And he will share his uh, research on site-specific quantification of aging-related uh, protein modifications by PRM. Um, but first, let's have a look at our company and the software we offer for proteomics uh, research. Um, Biognosis was co-founded more than 13 years ago by Rudy Aversolt, uh, one of the most prominent proteomics researchers worldwide. And since then, research and development has been at the center of our business. And this has really helped us uh, to build strong ties with uh, leading researchers. And so we're able to continuously innovate for the services and products that we offer. And today, we are offering a wide range of software, high quality peptide kits, and our services department is running one of the largest mass spec proteomics facilities in the world. Our customers are spread all around the world, um, and we um, work with them from Switzerland. Our software is built to provide three main benefits in general. So firstly, we offer leading performance and scalability across different proteomics applications. Um, our software is trusted by the scientific community, which is reflected by yeah, its wide use in literature that you can see here. Um, and thirdly, uh, we put very strong emphasis on building intuitive user interfaces that we constantly improve um, with the feedback we get from, from our customers. And these are our three main software products, uh, Spectronaut for DIA proteomics, uh, SpectroMine for DDA proteomics, and of course, SpectroDive in the middle here um, for targeted proteomics um, that we will hear a lot more about today. Um, Spectronaut is uh, probably our best known software and it has become the gold standard for DIA proteomics analysis over the last uh, few years. And one key feature I want to highlight here is uh, direct DIA, a really popular workflow that enables high performance DIA analysis without the need for an additional library. Um, and then we go to SpectroMine here, which is one of our newest products. Um, our software for DDA proteomics. And as you can see um, here for some example data set, it provides leading identifications uh, performance and can analyze data much faster than other software. So especially if you're doing isobaric labeling quantification, SpectroMine could be a great solution for you as well. And finally, for targeted proteomics, we're offering SpectroDive. And it is built to make targeted proteomics as simple as possible with machine learning assisted peak picking and the possibility to easily generate custom panels. Uh, SpectroDive benefits um, from a lot of the same technology that is in Spectrum and SpectroMine, uh, including the Pulsar search engine and automated FDR control. You can try out all our software products for free and there's special pricing available for academic institutions as well as bundle discounts and different licensing models. So you can find more information about that on our website and you can get in touch with us so we can find the best fit uh, for you. Um, before we go into more detail on SpectroDive, let me just quickly show you some additional resources that we have um, prepared for you. So there's a brochure that details the most important information about SpectroDive. And most recently, uh, we put a new tutorial video on our YouTube channel that helps you get started with the software as well. You can find both the video and the brochure on our website at biognosis.com slash SpectroDive. Uh, on the website, you can also request a free trial so that uh, you can test the software out for yourself. And with that, I'm now handing over to Tejas, who's the uh, lead developer of SpectroDive, and he will give you a general overview of the software and will also show you a real world example for using SureQuant in SpectroDive. 
Hey, thanks. Hello, uh, welcome to the launch seminar of SpectroDive. Um, so in the first part, part of my presentation, I will give a general introduction of SpectroDive and its key features. And in the second part, I will focus on analysis of SureQuant uh, in SpectroDive. Um, so what is SpectroDive? Uh, yeah, SpectroDive is our software solution for analyzing targeted proteomics data. Um, it has full support for a typical targeted proteomics pipeline, starting from panel development to retention time scheduling, and finally data analysis. It supports all major targeted workflows, and it comes with multi-vendor support. SpectroDive has been actively developed for uh, more than 10 years now, actually. Uh, in a manner of speaking, it started out as an extension of the m profit publication by Lucas Reiter, who is our CTO. First released publicly in 2013, uh, we have uh, recently published uh, major version 10 of the software. Over the years, there have been many publications that have been uh, uh, published using SpectreDrive, and some of them are highlighted here. So when we first started working on SpectreDrive, um, one of the bottlenecks in target proteomics data analysis was that identification was largely done via manual inspection making it impossible or very difficult to do high throughput analysis. Amprofit made a significant contribution there by uh, having a statistical validation of large-scale studies of MRM proteomics. One of the main goals we had when we started with SpectreDive was to further improve and automate the concepts proposed by Amprofit so that the entire process is robust and seamless. And to this day, that remains one of the uh, most distinguishing features of SpectreDive compared to other solutions on the market. So now I'll describe the core pipeline that makes this possible. The first and arguably the most important step is automatic decoy generation, which we have optimized for MRM and PRM. And what this means practically is that you don't need to measure explicit decoys uh, to perform statistical validation of your identifications. Then uh, the next step is uh, SpectreDive will do machine learning based peak picking and scoring for both targets and decoys. Um, and this allows it to do um, uh, FDR based identification using target decoy approach. So basically this pipeline gives you automatic statistical validation of your targets without you having to set anything or having to acquire special decoys. On top of this, SpectreDive also makes it easy to validate your data manually if needed. It comes with several experiment-wide visualizations um, that makes it efficient to get a bird's eye view of your data, of your targets, which can be quite helpful uh, for detecting uh, if there are any issues. For example, uh, in the top panel here, you can see the RT accuracy plot, uh, where you can quickly uh, see in the IRT dimension all, where all the peptides diluted. And then you can also see the relative fragment intensity in the horizontal side bar plot, and the background color uh, will tell you whether or not it was identified, green meaning it was identified. In this case, it was identified in all the runs. Um, I, manually picked, I manually picked a wrong peak for one of the targets to show you how easily you can spot an outlier. Um, if you see something like this, you can simply click on the red uh, on the uh, peptide in question, and SpectreDrive will automatically jump uh, to that specific peptide for which uh, you can then further validate using uh, the additional visualizations we have at the specific peptide level. For example, you can look at the MS2 XIC. If it is PRM, you can also look at MS1 XIC. Um, you can also look at MS2 spectrum at Apex RT, and you can also look at MS1 spectrum at Apex RT. Yeah, next key feature of SpectreDrive is a panel development, which of course is a pretty big part of targeted proteomics. Um, to facilitate this, SpectreDrive comes with Pulsar, as Max mentioned before, which is our database search engine, which can search mass spec data acquired in DDA or DIA mode. Um, we recently benchmarked Pulsar against uh, some of the other well-known uh, DDA database search engines and found that it identified more precursors and proteins while taking less time. So crucially, uh, the other thing uh, that is a key is that uh, the library generation in SpectreDrive will auto also automatically assign IRT values to all your peptides, even if you don't have the IRT kit uh, spiked in. So which makes it more robust against retention time fluctuations between acquisitions and gives a whole array of downstream use cases, some of which I will highlight later in the presentation. 
Next, you can create a panel from your library uh, in an easy to use wizard based interface. Yeah, at this time you can easily uh, select uh, which proteins you want, which peptides you want, uh, which fragment ions, and there's all sorts of filters you can use to make this process easier. You can also do on the fly assignment of labels. For instance, if, you have, if your library was label free, you can easily change it into uh, the panel into heavy and light and all kinds of combinations like that. And finally, SpectroDive lets you, uh, gives you tools to empirically refine your panel based on your trial runs, for example. For example, you can on the fly swap transitions between um, what is in your panel and any of the theoretical ones based on empirical measurements, which is possible in PRM, right? Uh, in the same way, it also lets you refine the IRT values in your panel uh, if you had to change your chromatography, for example. So once you have the panel, uh, then you need to be able to schedule it to acquire runs and uh, SpectroDive have a lot of features there as well. Yeah, so there are, for example, you can automatically um, use what we call high precision IRT workflow for scheduling. And this is where the fact that your panel already has IRT values, uh, which is coming from the library, uh, comes into play. So the workflow here is that you acquire your panel in an unscheduled or wider window uh, and process the initial run in SpectreDive. And SpectreDive will automatically create a calibration run. If the panel is large enough, it can also do nonlinear calibration, which lets you in turn use nonlinear gradients, which then you can use for scheduling your panel and then to acquire productive runs. Um, this works nicely if you have enough targets in your panel for creating a nonlinear calibration. However, if you don't have this, to work around this problem, we added a novel feature in SpectreDive, which lets you schedule based directly from your library. The concept here is that uh, you would acquire a background proteome in DDA or DIA mode using a nonlinear gradient. Uh, then you would use Pulsar for library generation which will automatically create a nonlinear uh, IRT calibration and then use the library for creating a calibration run, uh, which you can then use uh, to acquire productive runs. And uh, this really kind of solves that initial step problem um, and makes the entire uh, scheduling process very easy and streamlined. Um, besides that, SpectreDark automatically does uh, statistical analysis in your data I like differential abundance if you have specified conditions and also sample clustering uh, so that you can get actionable biological insights right as soon as your data is analyzed. That was a general introduction to SpectreDive and some of its key features. And next, I will uh, talk about SureQuant in SpectreDive. So SureQuant has been available since ASMS 2019 on thermoscientific Corvitrap uh, a fusion platform and thermoscientific Orbitrap explorers for AD. The key selling point of uh, SurePoint is that you don't need to do any scheduling. Um, so that part is kind of taken out uh, and basically simplifies your targeted uh, acquisition because it is based on internal standard uh, for triggering of uh, triggered acquisition, basically. It can be used with any set of SIS peptides and uh, there are already, at the same time, several kits pre-programmed in the instrument software, which you can also use for uh, your experiment. Um, here's a bit like a bit of an overview of how SureQuant works. As I mentioned before, SureQuant relies on the presence of SIS peptides for triggering the endogenous target peptide. So uh, in each MS1 full scan, you will check for the presence of an IS trigger peptide. And this is determined based on an intensity threshold. So that's in step two. And if it sees that there is an IS peptide possibly there and it passes the intensity threshold, it will trigger in step three uh, an MS2 for that IS peptide. And once it acquires that, it will match fragment ions that should belong to the SIS peptide. And this information is coming directly from the method. And if then enough fragments are matched, um, in step four, it will finally trigger an MS2 scan for the endogenous target peptide. And something to note is that the acquisition of SIS um, is done using a low resolution, which means it is very fast, whereas the endog endogenous target peptides are acquired using high resolution, which makes it very selective. 
as I mentioned before, we already support SureQuant and, and support for SureQuant in Spectre Dive is fully optimized and supported. Um, so uh, basically the workflow is very seamless, but there are some parts which you'll optimize further. You would start with your SureQuant raw, raw data and uh, you would just load them in Spectre Dive. If you don't have to change any settings, you can just work with default settings. Spectre Dive will do dynamic uh, mass and RT calibration. And then it will, as usual, do peak picking. And then uh, specific to SureQuant, uh, since um, the light can be triggered after the heavy, uh, you can get a little bit of a uh, shift for the, uh, for the beginning of the light uh, of the endogenous target. Um, so uh, a peak refinement is required. Um, and uh, Spectral will auto automatically take care of that as well. So that your quantification is uh, then uh, the relative quantification is uh, correct. And then it will do um, uh, identification uh, uh, based on FDR target decoy approach. And that we have also optimized the decoy strategy for SureQuant. And basically the entire pipeline then works as seamlessly as it works for MRM and PR. Um, like I mentioned before, um, you can do, you can acquire SureQuant with some of these pre-programmed kits or target peptide lists, or you can work with your own custom panel. And uh, there, uh, the way you set it up is that, as you remember before, um, in step two, you you require some threshold intensities for your SIS peptides. So basically, you need to define those for your custom panel. And the way you can do it is that you can acquire this sure quant survey run, um, and then you can identify the targets in that. And then in the survey run, you basically only acquire the SIS peptides. And based on then the monoisotropic peak of the targets, you can define the threshold intensities, which then go into your uh, final sure quant method. This part is also optimized and uh, seamless in uh, SpectroDive. So the workflow is basically you would first export a survey method from SpectroDive for your panel as I've highlighted in the red uh, box there. And then you would use that uh, transition list to acquire your survey run. And then you would pay, uh, take the survey run and analyze it in SpectreDive using the same panel. And then we just basically export the Shokon method and uh, SpectreDive will create the entire package, which is ready to be copied and pasted into your instrument software so that you can acquire your productive Shokon runs. At this point, I will also give a brief introduction of a PQ-400 reference peptide kit that we have. It basically covers the human plasma proteins and uh, 582 of those, and it contains 804 SIS peptides and 11 IRT peptides. Selection of peptides that we made was ex uh, experimentally determined um, uh, and based on robust peptide release and peptide stability in solution. And uh, the important part is that it's one of the kits that is pre-programmed in the instrument software so that you don't have to do the, the step I described before with the custom panel generation and the survey run. Now I have, now I have a, a small proof of concept study that we did based on uh, blood samples that were taken uh, from diagnosed prostate cancer patient samples stage 2B or 3. And they were age matched with healthy controls. So we had seven uh, uh, cancer patients and seven healthy patients. Um, and uh, we have plasma and serum samples that were acquired from all individuals. Uh, we processed them uh, based on native plasma or serum or depleted plasma or serum. So we basically had four types of sample preparation and uh, 14 months per uh, each uh, type of experiment. And then we spiked in PQ-500 uh, reference peptide kit in there and we acquired using two over gradient uh, on the Orbitrap Explorers 480 instrument. Using um, yeah, the key is that we used the pre-programmed um, method there and did not have to do any setup. As you can see, we got very high identification across all sample preps, which showcases depth you can acquire with SureQuant. And next, I will show you more in-depth analysis from the depleted plasma set. But the results we got with that were comparable for all four data sets. So uh, we found pro uh, process-specific antigen, PSA, to be one of the top candidates in our analysis. Furthermore, uh, we found some other interesting biomarkers like carbonic anhydrase 1, 2, and 3, and apoloprotein C4. On the right side, you can see the peptide profile of the PSA. 
uh, we have uh, for the two peptides that are in the panel. Um, here's an example profile of one of the peptides for PSA to illustrate how clean the data looks. And um, then we also have some ELISA data for the cancer patients. And here you can see the comparison of the absolute quantification reported by Spectrodive with the ELISA data. And as you can see, we found a very good agreement uh, between the two methods. And this is really cool when you think about how um, out of box the entire setup was. We prepped the samples, we spiked in peak refinery kit, we acquired the samples with uh, SureQuant pre programmed method, and then we just analyzed it in Spectrodive with the default settings. And then we have the data, as you can see here. And that's it, yeah. Um, so uh, that already brings me to the end of my presentation. So the two take home messages I would like to leave you with is one, Spectrodive simplifies um, the high throughput analysis as you saw. We have um, automated identification, powerful vis visualizations and an intuitive user interface. And uh, the other point was that SureQuant when coupled with Spectrodive and TQ Finite uh, especially is a uh, easy to use out of box method for targeted proteomics. And um, yeah, uh, then I will bring you to uh, acknowledgements. So there's several people from Biognosis involved and uh, yeah, I would like to thank all of them. And uh, next I will hand over to Simone Di Sanso who, from Leibniz Institute on Aging. And he will talk about uh, site-specific modification of aging-related protein modifications. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Tejas, and welcome also from my side. I really pleased to uh, present today my uh, PhD project, which uh, was about uh, the quantification of uh, specific uh, uh, PTMs in uh, related to aging and uh, how I use uh, SpectroDive uh, during my uh, during my project. So um, we all know that the homeostasis of protein cells is required to maintain the function of organs and uh, several studies show that the proteostasis is decreasing during aging and this is uh, due to several post-transcriptional mechanisms which can affect the proteome during aging among which uh, post-translational modification, for instance, glycation, can affect proteostasis and therefore affecting the protein turnover of uh, several proteins can affect uh, the structure and causing misfolding and protein aggregation. They can also impair the stoichiometry and therefore the uh, protein complexes assembly and, and finally also they could uh, create a cross-talk and uh, therefore um, impairing cell signaling. So um, up to now on the Uniprot website you can find more than 400 post-translational modifications reported which we can divide into big groups, enzymatic and non-enzymatic, um, while the enzymatic uh, post-translational modifications are characterized by high uh, specificity substrate. We know that non-enzymatic uh, post-translational modifications are described as a, a chemical reaction and uh, most of the time are not, uh, they not, not recognize specific uh, pattern. And I'm particularly focused on uh, non-enzymatic post-translational modification during my talk, uh, which can subdivide uh, further into big groups based on the physiological um, lifetime and stability. And during my talk, I will mention uh, only irreversible non-enzymatic PTMs, which uh, describe, for instance, protein glycation, which are caused, caused by an imbalance uh, between uh, uh, between, uh, for instance, uh, metabo metabolite uh, in uh, several processes, for instance, during aging, and also uh, can be caused by the accumulation of uh, reactive oxygen species. And uh, just to introduce, you, introduce to you uh, briefly protein glycation, it was first described by Maillard uh, more than 100 years ago, and it was uh, mostly describing the Browning reaction where you can see during uh, the um, process, the heat uh, food processing, as you can see here in this slide. And this process, this reaction is happening also on our organism. And uh, 
basically uh, as an end product of uh, protein glycation, we have uh, what they are called advanced glycation end products, which is a heterogeneous group of molecules. And uh, they, are this, they are the final product of protein glycation, which is the reaction of uh, reducing sugar, such as glucose, with the amino acid uh, side chain, mostly lysine and arginine, forming the, uh, the AGEs. But um, as I said, this is an heterogeneous group of molecules, and this is mainly due to the several uh, pathways involved in the formation of the AGEs. And I will mention only two in this case, which one is from the auto-oxidation of uh, reducing sugar, forming uh, the highly reactive decarbonyl products, for instance, methylglyoxin and glyoxin, reacting directly with the lysine, forming this product. And also, very important, we can have uh, the formation of the decarbonyl product coming from uh, lipid peroxidation. And our organism has a specific detoxification system, which is called the oxidase system, which, which try, uh, try to contract the accumulation of uh, this uh, uh, side product, uh, forming a less toxic uh, product, which is the D-lactate. But, uh, however, during aging, we have a decrease in terms of activity. This is relevant uh, to study this uh, particular um, uh, modification and AGEs in general, since it uh, has been shown that during aging, uh, the accumulation of uh, these AGEs can affect the lifespan, can be, can be also um, involved in the complication of several age-related diseases, such as uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and neurodegenerative disease, and also can impair um, uh, uh, several uh, protein stability and forming protein aggregation has been shown already. So what I tried to do during my PhD project was to develop an antibody enrichment for CML modified peptides combined with mass spectrometry in order to create um, a, a really deep studies in order to investigate the, um, the targets of uh, this uh, CM, uh, CML, which is a uh, carboxymethyl lysine, which is one of the most investigated and the most abundant AGEs. And uh, so applying these methods, uh, we have tried to identify targets of uh, this uh, CML in uh, in in vitro system, treating the cells uh, with the glyoxin, but also to apply um, ex vivo organs in order to investigate the targets of aging. And uh, Using this information from uh, the antibody enrichment, we also try to understand uh, a possible PTMs crosstalk and uh, uh, functional consequences of this modification on uh, at the cellular level. So, starting from the antibody enrichment of the CML uh, modified peptides, and we treated uh, uh, two different uh, models: mouse embryonic fibroblast and also human endothelial cells with the glyoxal in order to induce uh, glycation. And uh, we validate uh, the formation of CML by applying uh, absolute quantification using the liquid uh, uh, chromatography mass spectrometry. As you can see here, we have a dose-dependent increase of CML. And uh, therefore, I use this model and uh, uh, we um, perform protein extraction trips in digest in order to have uh, peptides and perform the antibody-based enrichment at the peptide level in order to have a less complex uh, samples to inject in the mass spectrometry. And uh, to uh, evaluate the performance of uh, the enrichment, we analyze either the no antibody enrichment, which was the input, and uh, the elution fraction. And as you can see from this bar plot, uh, we had um, a great enrichment of, uh, of uh, peptide spectrum match coming from CML when we were applying um, the, the, these methods. And um, to evaluate further the performance of the, of the methods, we could see that uh, our, our approach was uh, quite reproducible, as you can see from this Venn diagram, and uh, also from the biological point of view. Um, even though we were using an artificial method, so we were inducing glycation, we could see that uh, there are specific group of proteins which uh, seems to be a target of a CML in the different conditions. In the control, where I didn't use any glyoxal in the two different conditions. 
And also really important when you are using an enrichment protocol, yeah, we wanted to have information not only from the most abundant proteins which are uh, dis displayed here uh, on the left side of the rank plot, but we wanted to have information of modified proteins also from the low abundant. And as you can see here, the red dots are uh, evenly distributed along the curve. So, uh, coming to the, um, uh, to the help uh, of um, uh, parallel reaction monitoring using SpectroDive, I use it, um, the information coming from the uh, immunoprecipitation experiment. I, uh, I, we ask a company to produce a synthetic peptides identical as the one that uh, we uh, identified with the only differences that uh, these peptides are carrying on heavy ly lysine or arginine at the C-terminal. We created a pool and we spike in inside the samples in order then to analyze by PRM. And um, this information uh, coming from uh, the modified peptides, I, for my experiment, I use it uh, from the IP, but you can easily uh, create your target list coming from uh, your previous uh, study using DIA, for instance, uh, on uh, library creating a spectrum now, for instance, but you can create also directly library using SpectroLive. And uh, you just select the peptides uh, of your interest and uh, differently charged. And then, as the Tejas mentioned before, you create the panel generation. Um, in case you are uh, running a schedule analysis, you choose the, uh, the calibration run, and then you export your methods according to your parameters. And this is, was really helpful because we could validate uh, several uh, several peptides that we identified in the IP uh, uh, experiment. As you can see here, the coelution of the light, the endogenous peptides, together with the heavy uh, the spiking uh, peptides, meaning that what we see are really modified CML peptides. And also another advantage that you can uh, absolutely quantify the amount of uh, uh, endogenous peptides by the ratio created with the spectral dye between the light and the heavy uh, peptides. And uh, coming back to from the biological point of view, and uh, despite using two different systems, you work in MEFA, we could see that uh, uh, a group of uh, peptides were sharing a specific CML site and those that were mostly related to protein translation, chromatin remodeling, cytoskeleton, and mitochondrial proteins, and some uh, targets were already reported in the literature, so we're validating also our findings. And interestingly, we, find, we use um, a public protein turnover of uh, primary cells uh, in order to investigate whether protein turnover and also protein abundance were uh, a key factor for a proteins to be uh, CML modified. And this was the case in both systems. As you can see, the green dots are the modified um, uh, proteins identified in our data set. And as you can see, our, uh, uh, protein turnover and abundance are, uh, are a key factor for a proteins to be more prone modified. And um, coming from the ex vivo uh, part of my talk, we use uh, uh, young and old mice, uh, harvest heart, kidney, and liver, and uh, perform these three different approaches. So for protein abundance, we use TMT plex analysis, and uh, we applied also the uh, antibody enrichment analysis in order to identify targets in, uh, in these uh, uh, conditions. And also we try to, CMA, to quantify specific site of CML using PRM. So, um, starting from the protein abundance, we clearly distinguish two, group of, uh, the two groups from young and old nicely in heart, kidney, and liver, as you see from this PCA analysis. And interestingly, running this CAD pathways enrich, enrichment, we could see already that for heart and kidney, among the most upregulated categories, were this age age signaling pathway, which described the uh, proteins that are involved in the fibrotic process, but also in the process of uh, um, the reaction between the, the, the receptor for AGEs and the AGEs 
triggering all the cascade which is involved then in the inflammation process. And uh, digging uh, into the data, we could see that um, this uh, glyoxalase network, which I, I mentioned before, which is involved in the detoxification of the carbonate product, was uh, decreasing their abundance, as you can see here on the left. And also, we validate these findings uh, uh, showing that also the activity of the glyoxalase was reduced during the aging. Then we perform the IP on this tissue, and we could uh, see that. Um, the major findings was like uh, the CML seems to be site specific, uh, organ specific, uh, since we didn't have a main overlap between these three organs. And uh, um, without going too much into the details, heart were mostly involved in the ener energy production, while kidney proteins involved in cytoskeleton, and the liver more uh, proteins involved in detoxification. And uh, we use, uh, as I said, the PRM. And uh, we um, we perform um, the we calculate the limit of blank and the detection using uh, the MS start packaging in R. And basically, um, I started uh, um, uh, doing the experiment in this way, having my pool of synthetic peptides and performing a serial dilution using uh, yeast peptides as a background and then performing a PRM analysis in three replicates and then using MSTAT to perform LOD, LOB. And as you can see here from these, uh, uh, from these plots, you can appreciate the uh, high reproducibility of the, of the test and the, the high sensitivity performing PRM using spectrodive in, uh, in this system. And this allowed us to to go directly to um, not a rich tissue, so using a completely uh, total lysate from heart, kidney, and liver, and try to quantify specific uh, CML site. As you can see here, uh, for uh, the histone H4, uh, the modification lies in for, uh, 92, we could see that uh, quantifying the specific site by PRM uh, it give you also um, the overview about uh, how abundant is the modification, if, if this can be also justified by the increase in the protein abundance, as you can see here in some part, we're not uh, uh, explified just uh, by the changing protein abundance, which make a PRM combined with spectra a really powerful tool to investigate size specific changes in abundance. And uh, really important, and CML, it's happening on lysine, as I mentioned, and lysine is mainly used for several PTMs as ubiquitination, situation mutilation. And as you can see in this pie chart, the gray pie chart, you can see that around one third of our site identifi identifying these organs were known already for PTMs and mainly were. PTMs reported, a uh, site reported for ubiquitination and acetylation, which makes uh, this uh, specific uh, modification really interesting to study in order to investigate a possible cross talk between the PTMs. And uh, for the sake of time, I won't go too much into the details about the functional validation uh, using the UVEC, but uh, I did uh, the very same uh, experiment for the UVEC cells, and we could see that uh, several CML sites were reporting on the, on the tubulin. And uh, as you can see here for the bar plot, uh, this uh, tubulin uh, lies in S58. Uh, we could identify also performing acetylation pull down, and we could see a decreasing of acetylation Y in a dose dependent manner, while we see the other way around when we perform a pull down with the CML. So here is a direct competition on the same site for the two different PTMs. And uh, going to the most uh, important, uh, probably, um, uh, lysine uh, site on the tubulin uh, is the lysine 40, which is a uh, uh, highly studied in the literature, and we could see that in the immunofluorescence we could see a decreasing of acetylation when we are treating the cells with the glyoxan, and we validate also the doing western blood here on the right side. And um, interestingly, glyoxan seems to influence the microtubule dynamics, as you can see from again from this immunofluorescence for tubulin filaments, as you can see. 
um, when you are treated with the higher doses of glyoxal, a uh, microtubule seems to uh, to change structure and becoming more strongly. And, and this we validate also the change of structure using um, the polymerization uh, agent, which is uh, nocodazole. And uh, as you can see from the, the, the quantification in the bar plot, um, um, the microfilament are more resistant when you are treated with glyoxal. And this is, can be can be uh, possible due to um, a modification happening on the lysine, uh, as you can, uh, and uh, competing with acetylation. So, as to sum up what I showed you to, today, um, um, uh, prepare the strategy enrichment in order to identify CML modification in cells and tissue. And uh, it's really important to investigate this modification since it's irreversible, it can compete with ubiquitination and saturation uh, of lysis and uh, the powerful of targeted proteomics in order to investigate PTMs and uh, also how gly glyoxide can influence the microtubule dynamics by altering uh, the tubulin code. If you are more interested in this project, you can find on the preprint version by archive. With this, uh, I go to my end of the talk, and I would like to thank all the members of the ORI Lab, in particular Alessandro, for the great opportunity, all the collaborators that participate to this project, our funding and the diagnosis for the strong and high quality support. And thank you for the attention. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Simone. Uh, that was uh, really interesting to see how quantitative uh, targeted proteomics can help to better understand aging. And um, yeah, this already marks the end of our seminar. So thank you again to both our speakers, Tejas and Simone. Mm -hmm. And to all our viewers, uh, please feel free to contact us uh, via the website if you have any more questions or uh, would like to get a trial license. Uh, thank you for interest, and we look forward to hearing from you.